Well, welcome um, to those of you who are in the listening audience. Um, uh, my name is Skip Brown, and um, I, I always like to begin my presentations by saying how much uh, of an honor it is when I'm asked to meet with or dialogue with a group of health healthcare professionals like yourselves, and that I might have a subject or, or some kind of training or something that you might be interested in. Um, I always reflect back when I first started in histology and uh, how much I benefited from sessions such as this, and I grew and developed uh, my interest was a certain uh, level. And so I know that you all come to things like this with expectations. And so my goal and, and what I desire to do most is to meet those expectations and to let you leave this with some kind of information more than what you had when you first came in and you've invested your time and some labs, you've invested money um, for these sessions, and certainly we want this to be fulfilling for you. So thank you so much for being here, and uh, I want to commend each and every one of you for your continued growth and development um, in, in uh, histotechnology and just the medical profession. Uh, many times we get jobs in histology and we we become complacent with that, but the, the field is continually growing and developing and what we're going to be talking about today is indicative of that because something that we used to do very simple in the laboratories has now um, emerged to um, technologies such as tissue microarray and so forth. So uh, I commend you for continuing to grow and develop and get, and get your CEUs for this. And finally, I want to say um, uh, how much I'm sure I'm not the only one in the nation appreciates what you all have done in going to work every day and being the healthcare professionals that you are. Certainly in these times uh, of crisis and virus, uh, there's so much unknown out there. And those of you who are working in hospitals, um, you're in the midst of that. And um, we, we read all the time about you all don't have sufficient PPE and reusing masks, and, and those things are very challenging um, for you all to, to get past and go in and do the jobs that you do every day for patient care. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for being the professionals that you are. So today we'll be discussing a subject that uh, many of you have already done or probably are doing in some form or fashion in your lab right now, uh, developing and validating a multi-tissue control block. It's a little bit different from the, the title of developing panels. We're going to talk about developing panels, but all of this begins with how to develop the block and validate it. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And uh, we all use some form of control in our testing, but but one of the primary focuses will be the steps towards validating a control uh, that we use, uh, the data, the documentation, uh, the document retention, et cetera. Uh, and th in this day of regulatory compliance, it is not enough just to say we have a good working control that has been proven successful. Well, we've used this so many years, and the doctors have never complained. But th to be compliant with regulatory standards and to hold up to the scrutiny of lab inspection or heaven forbid, some form of legal issue questioning a diagnosis, you must be able to prove that this control that you used uh, was tested and validated. And for that, you need data and documentation. So I'm going to move on to the next slide right now, which is up there. Uh, today we're going to be discussing as our objectives the regulatory compliance mandate for validated con tissue control. We really don't have a choice over this now. If you haven't been dinged on this uh, and you're not doing it, it will soon come because uh, most of the inspections are going towards some type of um, documentation to show that uh, you have run these controls through whatever validation process that you have, uh, and you need to do that to be compliant. So then we're going to discuss the types of tissue controls that are being used now in the market and the application of the tissue control, um, the methods that are being used, whether it's manual or semi-automated or, or whatever, just to, in, in, in developing and constructing them. And the main part of this session is going to be learn how to develop a multi-tissue control block from the beginning, the, from tissue acquisition to the processing, embedding, to the com com communal block assembly, and then finally understand the method of control validation that must be performed before this multi-tissue control block can be used in patient testing. That's a very Im important point. Uh, this is not a valid test using this control unless you validated, validated it prior to using it uh, in a patient test. So on the next slide, I want to show uh, the regulatory compliance. Uh, 
And this is just basically taken from the abstract, and I'm going to read this very quickly. Please bear with me. Uh, the fundamental quality control element involved in any degree of patient testing is a control device or specimen that validates the performance of the test itself. This quality assurance measure ensures that the solutions, chemistry, testing methods, and the instrumentation involved in the test are all performing effectively. Everything is performing uh, as, as it should or expected. In histopathology staining, it is typically some form of test slide with a positive specimen that we will give that will give the expected positive response to the test. We see this type of quality assurance in routine H&E staining, but many labs don't document that that often. Uh, but we also see it in special stains, cytochemistry, uh, and particularly nowadays in immunohistochemistry. Testing slides such as this can be acquired through commercial vendors. We're going to discuss that briefly. Uh, or are developed via in-house manual methods. And that's where we're really going to focus today. So let's look now at, um, uh, this is an excerpt from the uh, um, CAP All Common Checklist uh, under the um, subject on the uh, area of test method validation and verification. And it basically says that laboratories are required to perform analytical validation or verification of each non-wave test method or instrument before before use in patient testing, regardless of when it was first introduced by the lab, uh, including instruments of the same make or model. So every time you get an instrument in, especially, you have to validate this control on that. Or even if you just get a loaner instrument where your one of your instruments is down, you have to validate that it works on that instrument also. And then this is bolded. There is no exception for analytical validation or verification of tests introduced prior to a specific date. So you can't say, well, um, we started doing this test uh, before, but we still use the same control. Um, if you haven't been, if you haven't validated that control on this new test, uh, even though it's the same stain or whatever, uh, it's not valid. It's, you're not in compliance. The, and then the laboratory must have data for the validation or verification of the application method performance specifications and retain uh, the records for uh, as lo as long as the method is in use and for at least two years after the discontinuation. I really didn't know that about the two years afterwards until I really started working in this area. So there it is right there. I mean, they're, they're, you're compliant or you're not compliant. And if an if a inspection team comes in and they don't ask for this, then you just got lucky because here it is in writing that they have, very, they have the authority and right to ask you for this kind of uh, documentation. So let's look at methods. Methods for... Um, uh, tissue um, using con tissue control slides, and of course we have the conventional. Uh, historically, we've always used a separate con quality control slide that had a tissue section positive for whatever substance or stain entity that we're testing for, uh, and the patient case. And we performed our staining test on the patient case slide simultaneously with the uh, quality control slide. Now, in the mid-1980s, I had a lab service called Lab, uh, I'm sorry, Southern California Immunoperoxidase Services, and I offered uh, what, what I called a unimount control with my IHC stain orders. And I marketed this as an enhanced quality control method to ensure that the patient case tissue received the exact same treatment as the control. And, and you, you have to understand that this was back when IHC was relatively new and for the most part a manual procedure and there was a lot of slide handling and I don't know if you all any of you all remember the old DACO kits where they had the colored reagents and the colored antibodies and each slide you handled in individually so there was a question or concern that did you do everything exactly the same with this control slide as you did with the other so this Unimount helped uh, alleviate uh, that, con that concern. So it was also more convenient to have a, a slide like this for pathologists to screen um, the control in the patient case without having to change slides. So that was a marketing thing that I used. Um, now, I believe a number of labs were doing this. Uh, this wasn't really rocket science. It was just practical to me. Um, but I'd never seen it published, but I know that other labs have been doing this. So it was something uh, that someone just thought of, like myself, and just started to do in, the la in their laboratory to enhance the con quality control. Um, now, in 1986, uh, Dr. Hector Batafor from City of Hope Hospital in Duarte, California, came up with this concept of the sausage block. 
and he was one of the pioneers of immunohistochemistry in the anatomic pathology lab. Uh, he well published. Uh, he uh, and this was at the time, as I said before, when IHC was still fairly new in histopathology laboratories, but very noted pathologist and a good teaching doctor. And he had this brilliant researcher named uh, 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 Ms. Prue Meta, who worked most of his projects. And so he was the head of immunohistochemistry, and she was the director of the IHC research and clinical uh, uh, immunohistochemistry lab. So he developed this sausage block that consisted of various pieces of melanoma, carcinoma, and other cancerous tissue, and they were all put together much like a sausage. Uh, they arranged this in a round sausage-type mold, and I think they used some type of cellulose type of medium. I'm not really exactly sure, uh, but it was random. The, the pieces in there were random, and once you cut it, you could tell which was melanoma, sarcoma, and so forth. And they cut pieces of the mold, this round mold, and, and placed them in a the mold and embedded them. And this gave them the first multi-tissue positive control for IHC staining. And, and you would use this slide along with your patient slides. Now, this was a tremendous leap in quality assurance in IHC staining. And, and this was later modified to what was known as the checkerboard block. Uh, one of the challenges of the sausage block was the arrangement on orientation of the tissues, of the control pieces. But the checkerboard allowed you to better orient uh, the tissues in a uniform pattern. Um, so uh, I think that in 1990, they, they brought that modification on. So, and Dr. Bo Dr. Badafour had uh, at the City of Hope, um, he had this, it was this great in teaching institution that he had created there. And every day in the afternoon, Dr. Badafour would have readouts. And all the pathologists and interns and students would come and bring their interesting IHC cases for the day and, and review. And it was almost like a daily tumor board. And they had this huge readout room. And I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, I believe it was something like 12 or 14 or 16 head scope. Um, and he would review the IHC cases and teach during this session. All the doctors would sit around. Now, I had just transitioned out of the lab uh, to work for uh, a company as a staff scientist, uh, a company that had an automated IHC stainer, and they had one of these stainers in his lab. Uh, so I worked as a trainer, and whenever they put one of these in, I would go in and train the staff, not only on the instrument, but a lot of times, like I said, this was back when IHC was new, uh, the lab had never done an immunohistochemistry before, and the technicians didn't know anything about that. But my job in reference to City of Hope was to make sure that the, there were no technical issues with the system and the unit that we had and to consult to consult with Dr. Batterfour on antibody staining. Uh, so I would arrange my day uh, so that almost every day I was there in the afternoon for this readout. And Dr. Batterfour allowed me to sit at one of the scopes and I just listened and, and took notes and learned. And um, this was a tremendous opportunity for me to grow and develop in my understanding of IHC. And he always used this sausage block um, and eventually, he started using his checkerboard block. Um, so anyway, to make a long story short, this was the beginning of tissue microarray technology. Um, uh, they, they developed the sausage block and then the checkerboard block, and the design was later modified in 1998 by uh, Jay Kanonen and a group of researchers uh, to the current structure and form that we have today. And so uh, this is what actually led to the tissue microarray. So now... This is the high end of multi-tissue control block design. Uh, this is mainly for labs that have a high degree of advanced IHC staining panels, such as breast cancer studies or other cancer research. But for the regular hospital or reference laboratory, which I believe most of this audience is, there is also the more uh, appropriate or a practical or applicable multi-tissue control block that can be custom designed and developed at a much lesser cost for your specific applications. And this is the real strength of this. You can design this specifically for your pathologist needs. Uh, he likes to do carbohydrate staining, but he only likes to do these certain ones. Well, you can design a control just for that. And so um, even in, in your immunohistochemistry also. So there's a lot of different uh, applications for this. And uh, moving on, the revolution in IHC control test efficacy, uh, the multi-tissue control block, we talked about that, Dr. Batafora and uh, Pru Meta, but we, the chronology of this goes, as I said, the sausage block in 1986, checkerboard in 1990, 
and the current version, which looks like a TMA block in 1998. But now the last two bullets is what I really want to focus on now because this technology or this science, I mean, technology soon started to catch up with this science. Um, we see three, well, the science had gone far ahead of the technology, but then companies and vendors and, and they started to look at, well, how can we make this uh, an easier process to facilitate? How can we take some of the manual uh, nature out of this? And how can we give them more, uh, better tools at uh, organizing, uh, systematizing, and, and, and developing this so that um, it can actually be used a lot more effectively? So they began to develop manual met manual tools and so forth that you could use to create these multi-tissue blocks. And then there was the advances in instrumentation where, uh, and this is when tissue microarray was really um, um, coming on, uh, semi and fully automatic automated s instruments because it was very tedious to do this work as you can see in the TMA block at the bottom of this. Uh, can you imagine manually doing this one at a time? And some of the first instruments came out were for manual uh, construction of a block like this. But uh, as I said, technology continued on, and then we got into the uh, the automated instrumentation. So me methods of multi-tissue control manufacture. Um, I, I'll give you these three images uh, to show how industry began to develop tools and utensils to help facilitate that manual method or uh, block construction. And the most basic being on the far left, and you take various pieces of tissue, and this is basically what we do in our labs every day. Uh, you want to, uh, you, you want for the control, and you have to think this out ahead of time uh, that you, you, you do for the block you you want to create, and you embed them into a communal block. So they have to be small pieces um, that usually are done by you, trimmed by you. And in the center uh, image, we see um, uh, tools that were created to extract uh, punch sections or punch biopsies from a donor block and to extract that into a recipient block. And that's what we see in the center and in the far uh, right. So now the, the technology and, and industry is starting to develop tools to make this an easier process. But as uh, the science continued on, uh, industry uh, technology continued with that, and they began to develop these three methods that we see here in instrumentation. Now on the far left, you see an instrument that was basically designed for still to do this manual process, but it, it facilitated to be done a lot easier and a lot smoother and, and allowed you to have uh, a lot more control over the tissue placement, a lot more organization and so forth. Uh, it allowed you to be more efficient uh, in mapping a grid. And so in the center one, this is an example of a semi-automated unit, which is even more advanced. And then on the far right is a fully automated tissue microarray unit. So as you see here, the different methods of constructing this uh, type of block are far advanced now, uh, if you have the use for that. Now, as I mentioned, this is almost exclusive, exclusively for immunohistochemistry research when you get into this level of uh, multi-tissue tumor block or TMA construction. Um, uh, In-depth cancer research and things like that, as I mentioned before, breast uh, cancer or other cancer uh, treatment facilities would, would want something like this. But in your laboratories, for the most part, most of you all don't need anything this high end, and you have a need for something that you can control and that you can actually custom design better. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the multi-tissue control in lab design process. And this is, a, this is just an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, the in lab process of doing this on your own. It's not a very difficult procedure, but it does take time and thought as to what you want to create and how you're going to go about it. Um, I remember back when we, when I, years ago in histology, um, someone said, well, this is the control we use, and we would use that because someone told us to use this control. And it was verified, but there was no documentation on this. We didn't keep paperwork like that. It just wasn't a need at that time. And so what happens like nowadays when the years later, the supervisor is different in the laboratory, maybe even the techs are different, and in comes an inspector and says, and he says, well, show me this, uh, how do you validate or verify your control? He said, well, this is the control we've always used, and the doctors sign off on it every time we do a stain. 
well, how can you verify that you validated this as a stain for this stain that you're doing? And you just look with a blank look on your face. So this is important nowadays to go through this process. So um, we look at tissue acquisition, and I'm going to run through this very fast because you're going to see this a couple of times today. We look at tissue acquisition, and I give you two primary methods of doing that. Um, you can use a primary source. Or you can, you know, which would be the gross room, and this would be a tr pool tissue uh, from your repository. And however your laboratory or your pathologist approved that tissue, typically, um, in most of the labs I ever worked at, uh, I took tissues that was the tissue that were about to be dumped, that were about to be discarded. We had taken these tissues and whatever, if you kept them for a month or two months, and, and, and then discarded them. Those are the tissues that I, I, I used, and, and I was approved for that by my pathologist. Secondary sources, you can always cannibalize blocks from approved cases that are arch archived, and you have to get the permission or, or approval from your pathologist to use certain cases. And now, I don't like this method that, that much because you can't control everything. The tissues have already been um, selected, they have already been processed, uh, you don't know what happened to it before you just use it. So you could do that, but um, uh, I prefer to use the primary source uh, of the gross room, where, especially when we're talking about H&E staining. Uh, you want to test each block separately before you assemble them. Um, talk about that in a little more detail. The control block assembly, you want to put all those together once you have the tissues. The staining tests, you always want to do those side by side with your current block and then the validation runs. Um, you need to do at least three validation runs. And one is not enough. Uh, two, you could probably get by with that. But three is a, is a set number. And this basically is to show reproducibility and consistency in the stain. Um, so then technical review and sign off. And this is very important because just for the supervisor or the manager to do it, um, it's usually not sufficient. You need the medical director or the pathologist to sign off on this, to look at these slides and then sign off on this. So that's the basic overview of, of, of designing that. And con to continue on, and this is a little bit more of a granular look at a control block. And I mentioned tissue acquisition again, uh, because this is such a, an important part. Uh, you want to choose tissue types and inform the pathologist uh, to retain the tissues, growth, and process the tissues separately. Now notice I have in the parentheses histotechnologist controlled. Uh, and we're going to get to, there's a, there's a slide that I want to show you about that, but you want to have control over these tissues. Uh, the pathologist or PA can select them from you, but you need to be in control of, of trimming them, getting them to the size that you want, because you rem remember, you're making multiple tissues into one block. So um, the pathologist or PA, they, sometimes they just throw stuff in a cassette just because you ask for that type of tissue type. So then after that, you stain section stain and review the individual blocks, tissue blocks. And then you in, you embed, you uh, melt down the, the blocks that you want or the tissues that you want. You embed the individual tissue blocks that you, t tissue sections or pieces into a communal block. And then you section that block and stain it concurrently with your control tissue blocks. Uh, and then finally, the technical review by a medical director or designee, and I put in parentheses, Limit the reviewers because you get, and I'm saying this respectfully, you get 10 pathologists in the room and you get 10 different opinions, especially about an H&E. And you'll never get to uh, consensus on what's a good stain. Um, and you're just trying to create a control. And here they st start talking about the stain and the quality of the stain and so forth. So I would limit it to one to three reviewers, uh, preferably one. And then the technical review of the validation runs by the medical director and then the sign off, you, and which means you need documentation on all of this. So those are the basic methods, but let's look at the beginning. Tissue selection for MTC control. Now, you want to start off by, um, well, when I, I, first, I went to a lab once, um, I worked at a lab when I first got there as a manager, um, and they used for their H&E control uh, a huge, uh, lymph node, and, and this was great. This was a great piece of tissue to use um, if you only wanted to see um, uh, nuclear staining. But uh, this wasn't really good at showing uh, some of the cytoplasmic staining in the, in the tissues. So I had a problem there. So what we did was, what I did was I 
develops this multi-tissue con uh, control block. And what you want is important to have various different tissues, especially with H and E, that will demonstrate the different levels of basophilic and eosinophilic staining. So I, uh, this is basically what I use, um, and I recommend that you use this to start. Skin, kidney, liver, uh, lymph node, or tonsil, that'll give you your uh, nuclear staining. Muscle, that'll certainly give you a certain degree of information on the eosinophilic staining. And then also, um, you want some degree of fatty tissue. Uh, so I put over here in red, breast tissue and colon. And so you want a represent representation of that also. So then you want to make a note to the pathologist. And this is very important because this will minimize your time because acquiring the tissue is probably one of the big, biggest challenges and takes the most of the time. Once you've determined what tissue you want, you need to communicate that with the pathologist uh, or whomever is doing the grossing. So you want to leave a note, and I would even say leave notes in plural, because uh, they might forget or they're working in a certain area and the note's over here. But what I would do is I would always uh, post the notes, uh, post it over the grossing table, near the um, near the grossing table or wherever I, I knew that they were going to be working so that they would get sick and tired of seeing this note. Um, you need multiple notes. Um, acquiring tissue can be one of the biggest challenges because the PAs get focused on the volume of work that they have for that day and concentrating on grossing uh, and not missing anything in their grossing. And it might take um, a reminder a few times uh, to remind them. Uh, I suggest that you have a personal discussion with them in the beginning to explain what you need this for and uh, and how you need their assistance. And then oftentimes you get their buy-in for that. Now, you have to be very specific with this. Uh, you let them know, you know, I need these three cassettes for uh, each one of these tissues, and you can put them in 10% formalin and give them back to me uh, because they'll get lost. Uh, so the, Someone will take them and put them somewhere else. So they need to come back to you definitely. Now, uh, this is the slide that I wanted to use to take you back to where I said histotechnology control. Because in the gross room, the pathologist, sometimes they're in, in a great hurry depending on the volume that they have. And you see a section here of, I think, a cervix on the left and certainly breast tissue on the right. And, and they're, they're racing through these things. And if they get around to doing your tissues, sometimes they might just be focused on getting you a representation of that tissue. And you you can't rely on the grossing. Uh, sometimes you see this section that I just introduced in right here. Um, this is, I believe, a uterus. But you see the sections that, that are, are initially cut. They might, uh, might You might have a hunk of tissue in there, and they put that in the cassette for processing. And if you're not monitoring this, one of these is going to go through. It's not going to receive the appropriate processing, and now you have problems with what is supposed to be your control tissue. So you want to control this so you can see this small section of tissue right here that I just introduced uh, in the center top, uh, trimmed and so forth to the level that you want it. And that's what we're looking for. And that's why you have to control that. They can, they can acquire the tissue for you, but you have to inspect that tissue. And so next slide, uh, the grossing of the trimming. You want to place the multiple tissues of one type into one cassette, conserve, you don't need five different cassettes for kidneys, if you can get them reasonably into one cassette, um, well, your five tissues is probably a lot. Um, but you don't need to have a separate, at this point, you don't need to have a separate cassette for each tissue. Uh, so you do this all for different tissue types. You want them all labeled kidney, if it's kidney, or you want, want them all labeled liver, if it's all liver. And then um, after processing, you can take them out, uh, and but you want to separate them now into separate blocks. Um, you want to label the tissues, uh, the cassettes, um, same specific type of tissue. It might, it might be kidney one cassette or kidney two cassette, kidney three cassette, because this is what you're going to look at when you decide which are the best ones that you want to pull from and make your, your communal block. Uh, you want to section, stain, and cover slip, and review slides for staining quality and tissue morphology. Review each slide separately and check for autolysis. Now, I've been challenged on this before, and people have said, well, that takes too much time. You, you're, you're basically doing it, and then you're melting back down, and you're doing it again. Well, I can tell you, I learned from uh, personal experience on this, that oftentimes the tissues that you get, you don't know exactly how they were handled, uh, how long before they were 
were um, actually grossed. Um, I know I had a section of liver once that I, I and I learned this, uh, this from this. Um, I had a section of liver uh, amongst about four of the different tissues, and that liver liver had came from a patient um, who had sat in autopsy for quite a while before they actually did the autopsy. And so when I got the section, all my tissues were fine except this one liver that had a lot of uh, hemosiderin and a lot of enzyme breakdown. And but I had already embedded that into one big block, so I had to go melt that down and use a different liver. So you can circumvent all of those problems by doing it this way. Test each one of your blocks, your tissues, separately, and then you have them in separate blocks, and then you will melt, select the acceptable blocks, and then I'm going on to the next slide. Then you want to melt down those preferred test blocks, select and embed the, multi, the different tissue types into one communal block. And usually, um, in this, usually about four or five different specimens, different tissues, would be equivalent for a multi-tissue control block for H and E staining. You want to section the multi-tissue control block and stain it concurrently with your current control block, and that's your with your side by side with that. Uh, you want a technical review of the new empty um, multi-tissue control. Uh, and current control side by side, you want the, doc, the medical director or doctor to to review that at the same time. Uh, you again, you want to limit the number of reviewers, and then your validation runs. Uh, you want to do that, and then sign off and document retention. So all of this is very very important in, in the process of doing this. Once you get your tissues, it flows pretty quickly, but this is not something that's going to happen overnight. So you're going to have to plan for this. Um, but it's very simple to do. Now, here is a, is a slide. Of, let's move on into documentation now uh, and, and document retention. Um, this is the validation form that I created, and you can create this on your own. You can use something like this, or you can restructure it, but you need some type of documentation form, some type of validation form. And it starts out by saying this document outlines the hematoxin and eosin performance validation runs for the new multi-tissue control, quality control block for the Department of Histopathology. And I go through the construct saying out how I do that. Now, phase one is only the only one that I really want to focus on right now. It just says what we did. We took three separate independent slide staining runs of, of this block uh, that we approved and we, we liked, but now we're doing the validation. So we took three different runs and we used it. Uh, we did it side by side with the approved slides. Now, phase two is is, is optional, and, and why I say this because I, I'm pretty anal about validation. I mean, I like to, I, when I'm under inspection, I always like to give the inspector more than he's going to ask for. But I use this because in addition to doing the, the regular validation in phase one, I took blind clinical samples of cases that we had had that are archived, and I wasn't really looking for the pathology or the diagnosis. I just wanted to use them side by side with my multi tissue control block. And I would run those together and, and that would be like my blind sample to show that see in phase one you're just checking control against the control. But in phase two you're checking control against a real live patient tissue. I mean it's archived. So it's a blind sample and no one knows the name or anything about the patient or the patient number and we just labeled it blind sample one, blind sample two. But um I'd like to do that. I did that, and um, that was very successful, and it helped strengthen my validation process and results. So the results, this is uh, C, uh, results sheet from separate validation runs, which is going to be the next slide. And then the summary, there were the acceptable or non-acceptable, and then you get to sign off on this. So very important, you have to have this. So the next slide is the results page. Now this is a simple results page that where you sign off or you show the uh, acceptable or, or non-acceptable from your validation runs. Um, and so I just did this in a simple Word document, and it's not very hard to do. Um, uh, you create a simple Word document where you show the difference, the different validations runs, and you show that they were done side by side with the existing approved uh, control. You don't have to put, uh, you, you don't have to. Uh, uh, you don't have to do this, but you can extend your validation into blind samples, and that's what I've done here. So here they would check acceptable, understanding control, 
or in on the MTC one, MTC three different runs that I did, um, and then also on the MTC control. Now you can redesign this. You can have this for one block, or you can do the MTC one to be one different block, two different blocks. But you have to do three runs on each block, each control block that you created, and then get the sign off. So then now let's we talked about that. We talked about validation. We talked about the, the applications. Let's talk about well. Let's talk about some of the benefits and applications. So the benefits are it helps you organize the immunohistochemistry controls by the order of antibody panels instead of having you know an S1 100 control box box and a P53 control box or whatever. You can have your breast panels that your doctor doctor wants to see. You can have a, 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 a control box that has um, the breast panels that he usually requires, and you can have all those different stains, those controls in there, or you can have it from bro prostate mantle, uh, panels, et cetera. Uh, control, organized special stain controls by the order of the stain entity, like so far as your liver panel, uh, you do a lot of liver stains. Well, if you have these control boxes in there, you can, these, contr these control uh, blocks in these slides, you can have that whole control box set for doing uh, uh, liver panels for your pathologists. Or the same with fungi and carbohydrates. And these controls, this is what really is powerful about this. These controls can be made specifically for the pathologist's commonly ordered stains. So you don't have to waste a lot of time with other controls and so forth. You know he always orders this, uh, or most of the time he orders this. So you can make controls for that. You minimize the control block storage needs uh, instead of having multiple different uh, blocks stored or even uh, control uh, box slides. Uh, one block can consist of tissues from one to four different uh, blocks. And so you're streamlining the workflow from sectioning multiple different control blocks when you get a stain order to having all of this already prepared. And then the lab has flexibility on determining how many tissues with the multi-tissue control block that you want to put in there. Um, you can do as, as few as three or even two or five. It just depends on what you want and the preference of your laboratory. So now let's look at the customized control blocks, uh, just to look in detail. Now I used to work for, when I had this um, um, service that I was telling you about, I used to have a, a pathologist that was a dermatopathologist, and it, most of the orders that he sent me were S100 vimentin and cytokeratin, uh, because he was trying to differentiate uh, from melanoma, sarcoma, and, and, and carcinoma. And he would look at uh, respectively whether it was heavy, heavily positive staining, moderate staining, or negative expression on these stains. And so what I did was I developed a multi-tissue control block for, for, for a specific stain panel for him. And he used this, and this was very uh, advantageous for him because it gave him less slides that he had to go through. Uh, it gave him more assurance that each one of these controls was handled the same way. And so I just created that block from known pieces of tissues that uh, I had in, in our storage bank. And I took existing controls and I cannibalized them into multi-tissue controls. So it's very simple, very easy to do. Now let's look at some of the other uh, panels that can be developed from this. Liver panel. Uh, most laboratories that have pathologists doing a lot of liver stains, they'll order trichrome, retic iron, and uh, PAS with and without. Sometimes they don't order the PAS. But uh, the trichrome, retic, and iron can all be in one multi-tissue control block. Now, the PAS, with and without, uh, I did that offline because, you know, you're staining those with and without diastase, and uh, so that was problematic, and I didn't think that I could make that work in the same tissue block, so I did that offline. But still, you see here, the trichrome, retic, and iron, and our pathologists were ecstatic about this. They really loved this idea of being able to look at the differentiation of stain in all these uh, three different tissues. On microorganisms, uh, you can put gram positive and gram negative specimens on the same slide. Uh, we did. We manufactured this. We took. A, we worked with our microbiology department, and we took Staph uh, aureus, uh, and we took a Escherichia coli uh, for the positive and negative, and we injected, uh, I think, a liver with this. And so in 24 hours, I think at 37 degrees um, temperature, we incubated this overnight, and uh, we had an organism, and then we sort of we uh, fixed it 
and then we processed it, and we had a section that gave us gram-positive and gram-negative stainings uh, in the same tissue. Um, so then fungus, uh, actinomyces, aspergillus, histoplasma, cryptococcus, um, you see by the morphology of each one of these, you can you can place multiple of these into one uh, cassette, uh, one block. Sometimes it might be uh, difficult to differentiate um, with the ovoid or yeast-like cells, but still this can be an advantage. And if you don't agree with using this um, for certain stains, you can certainly use it for others. So this is a very, very uh, powerful and very useful tool that we can use when we're doing this. So now, um, at the end of the day, this is what you come up with. Um, this is one that was designed for H&E staining. And um, you have five different tissues here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, on the lower right, far right, this was a section of colon. Um, and then up from that was a section of liver. And then across from that on the top, on the left, the section of kidney. And down from that was a section of uh, tonsil or lymph node. And then in the center was skin. So we use this for our H&E staining. And now, mind you, these tissues that you have, once you've validated these tissues or you, you're sure these tissues, you have more than one section from the block that you create. I mean, not the block, but from the bank of tissues. So once you run through this block, you, you have the same tissues that you can use for another block. So this can last you quite a bit of time in, in when you create these. But this is very powerful uh, um, resource that you have in your laboratory. As I said, it takes time, and it's not something that you're going to be able to do overnight. But it gives you a lot of different flexibility uh, and control, and you can basically create these to the preference of your pathologist. So this is basically most of the presentation, or pretty much the presentation today. It's not really rocket science. Uh, I encourage all of you to take the time and to do this. If for nothing else, you're H&E stained. Um, and uh, it's going to give you a lot more confidence. It's going gonna, it's gonna to boost your, uh, your quality assurance and quality control, not only in H&E staining, but in your special stains and certainly in your immunohistochemistry also. Uh, tissue microarray is the high end and the, 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 definitely the best way to go. Um, but in a, in a routine, regular histopathology laboratory, uh, do you really need the tissue microarray and do you need the instrumentation, the apparatus? You can basically do this for your special stains in h and E's, much smaller cost, um, doesn't take up a lot of footprint from instrumentation, and it's very simple to do. And you get a lot of gratification in knowing the confidence that you have in this control because you created it. Uh, you controlled it from beginning to end, and you have uh, the assurance that this validated control can be used effectively um, until it runs out. So I want to uh, give just a few final notes, uh, thoughts, and those are uh, plan this out before you start. Uh, be patient. You can't do this overnight. Do your testing, validations, and sign-offs, and do that with close scrutiny. And your document retention, make sure you do that. So I hope that you all have gained something today and, and uh, maybe encourage you all and motivated you to go out and do this yourselves if you're not already doing it. If you are doing it, uh, maybe some of the things about documentation or validation are something that you can take with you. And if you were always already doing both, uh, the, the, the creation and the validation, I want to thank you for at least giving me this time to sit here with me and go through this. So at this time, I am going to turn the presentation back over to Alicia. And before I do, I want to say thank you all very much. Stay safe out there, and thank you for your commitment uh, to the to the uh, to the patient and uh, to your profession. Thank you very much.